Eric Denner, who has a PhD from Michigan State University. So they're both very well aware, and Eric has actually done, and Kip has actually done some research on some of the REA components that we talked about an awful lot in last term's 821 and 823 class. So this in, in thinking about things, when I, I called Eric Denner, I think in 1990, 1996, one day when he had left academe and said, now that you, and he'd done some consulting, I said, now that you're in an industry position, what would you tell someone <clears throat> that um, that's still doing consulting? And he said, study history. That's a good thing to do is to study history. So we're gonna talk a little bit about history here. If you go back to 1964, actually, which is the year I was born. So over 50 years, this, uh, this graph kind of gives you a sense of some history here. The blue line is a calculation I have and the, the back of the deck has the notes around where these numbers came from, is, um, is the growth in computing in the world over that period of time. The orange line is the drop in computer cost, com specifically storage computer storage costs, because those are numbers were easy to obtain and track. And um, you're gonna see this graphic a number of different times, this sort of trend, but in all of this growth, I mean, you look at what we're going on here, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about principles that would have been very well understood to developers in this age, because when it comes to financial and business systems, this is when they were uh, poured in the concrete in a certain sense. And a lot has changed then in the amount of computing we have available. And yet, because the systems were laid out when, we, when cost was this high for computing, almost $10 million for, I think it was a megabyte of storage in that, um, in that time, you know, what could you do with a computer when, when storage is just that expensive? We'll, we're going to explore that here a little bit, right? Um, okay, so let's talk about transactions versus balances. Um, the R, a, a simple way of in my interpretation of the REA uh, original paper was to really say transactions have primacy. Um, transactions are the system of record, and they are incredibly flexible in that if you have all of the transactions for anything you want to analyze, you can produce any analytical output that those transactions support. They have all the attributes on them. You can combine them in any way possible. If you didn't capture an attribute, we can't help you with that. If the attribute wasn't captured on the transaction, that's lost. But as long as it was recorded, you can use it in any way as long as you're using the transactions. And so because of the, the, the primacy, um, they eliminate reconciliation. And, and if you use transactions, as long as your code is right for using the transactions, you'll always get the correct answer. It's just impossible to do otherwise. But that's not how the business system is built. Business, business world uh, systems aren't built that way. There are, the business system world is full of balances. Ledgers, really, although this seems to be forgotten in the world, ledgers are the process of creating balances. Posting to a ledger is the process of updating a balance. And the reason balances are important is because they're efficient. They are efficient both from computing um, capacity and from analytical processes because it eliminates the need to re-aggregate transactions to get to positions. When you look at a balance, it gives you information right then. Just what, it's the first thing. When you open your, when you look at your bank account, the first number you look at is the balance. What is my balance in my bank account? And that, you don't look at all the transactions because the balance tells you what the position is at this moment. And that's efficient for you from an analytical perspective, but it also is efficient because the computer, if you, if you, every time you log into your bank account, 
you had to go back, the computer had to go back to all the transactions from the first day you opened your bank account until the moment that you logged in and re-aggregate those transactions. You're consuming a large amount of compute capacity to get to that position. So balances are very efficient. But balances have downside, right? They're effectively a duplicate of the transactions. We, we select some attributes, we'll talk more about that in a minute, to create balances. And because they're a duplicate, they tend to be able to drift from what actually the transactions say. Um, an auditor, if he came in and audits the, the business system, if the balances are wrong and he can't support those from the transactions, the balances are wrong. He won't sign off on the balances because they have to have supporting transactions. They also only contain a subset of the transaction attributes. That's what you have to do to make a balance. And so they're not anywhere near as flexible in reporting. Also making balances requires some level of processing that goes beyond the storage of the transaction itself. Okay, we're gonna go through this a couple of different ways, but let's talk about you know posting key. Again, if we'd been in 1960s class to talk about financial systems, this would have been 101. Making a posting key is selecting a set of attributes that you can aggregate on that are gonna be meaningful for reporting purposes. This is what a ledger is is a subset of the attributes on the transactions. Uh, Luca Pacioli, when he defined the accounting process, he was effectively saying your ledger is going to be some set of, when you wrote down in the day book, all of the things that, that went on at the transaction time, those, all of those things didn't end up in the ledger. Only a subset of those things that you wrote down ended up in the ledger as an aggregation of what the transaction looked like. If we tried to post all of the attributes of, a, of the transaction to our ledger, you end up with no aggregation, no summarization, particularly if you use something like timestamp because the, you don't do two transactions at exactly the same millisecond. Um, you always end up, you have to take and, and deselect certain attributes in order to make a balance and, and that, and the number of attributes you choose and the number of values in those attributes determines how many balances can be made from that for that set of transactions. Okay. Okay, we're going to kind of start talking about the daily financial cycle in a certain sense, but this is, this is saying the same thing again, kind of a different way, right? If we, if we were to produce any of our analytical outputs, if these are days of the week, and, and, the, and the report processes we needed, the balances we needed to get to, to tell us, you know, what's outstanding receivables, or what's the... What's my income for this period of time? Or what are my expenses? Any of those, anything that goes on a report, almost, we do some reporting around transactions, but by and large, almost all of our reporting starts with a balance in some way, even on the income statement, that you know, the income statement is, a, is activity over time, but the income statement tends to be a balance. Everything on the income statement is a balance accumulation of transactions. If all of the transactions we need in the organization equal 600 balances every day, whether those are stored in ledgers, whether those are stored on, printed on reports, shown on screens, uh, stored in Excel, if that's what we have to produce and our transactions start with basically 600 a day, if we use the transactions to make those balances and those balances include time, so we're accumulating over time, right? The balance sheet for IBM, includes every transaction IBM has engaged with and every transaction, every entity IBM purchased over the years from the first capital infusion check to uh, by, the, by the first shareholder uh, owner of IBM, all of those, the impact of all of those transactions are accumulated and stored in today's balance sheet. 
Um, and so over time, we would have to continually add more and more transactions every day to continually produce those balances that reflect the impact of those transactions over time. That means it's high processing cost, but because we're using transactions, it's very low reconciliation cost. Okay, the opposite side of that is to use a posting process. And so on day one from the transactions, we make the 600 balances that are required, but now we have to reconcile the, the, the yellow represents the reconciliation balances that we have to reconcile to what we need for the reporting processes. And then the next day, if we take the transactions from the first day, from the, from the, the next day, add them to the balances, it's very efficient because the volume of data being processed never increases because every day you just take yesterday's balances, today's transactions, and you produce a new set of balances. The next day you take yesterday, the day before balances, the new transactions produce a new set of balances. So the processing cost is very low from using balances, but we're now producing new balances every day. And so our reconciliation cost and the number of balances we have continues to grow because those balances can, can drift from what the transactions, if we have a backdated transaction in some way or an error adjustment or something of that sort, the balance becomes incorrect. Okay, now, because of that, when we go back to that early days of computing um, in 19, you know, the 1960s and 19, early 1970s, I have some videos on my YouTube channel on conversations with Kip, if you want to look that up, um, that show historical IBM videos about computing processes, and they're astounding. One of them is a set of executives um, at, in Poughkeepsie, New York, a banking executive, senior banking, banking vice presidents that are watching card readers and sorters and printers produce a trial balance if you can believe that. These are senior vice presidents and they interview some of the end and these people are very impressed with what they've seen. See those people in that day, they had people sitting at desk that did what the computers do. And so as a senior vice president, you saw what people had to do to post to ledgers on a daily basis. So when they see this automated, they all of a sudden can see, wow, I've taken a a room for, full or a building full of people. And I've got these boxes here in front of me that can do what they do. And they understood how they were doing it. You know, they could see each piece of the system. All of that hardware in 1959 is one of the videos. All of that hardware is translated into software today. Um, so we don't actually have individual different pieces. And all that software is uh, the principles behind that software has been forgotten because it runs so consistently so well. I mean, the, the events of this week, right? The COBOL, the need for COBOL programmers for processing unemployment claims. Well, those systems, they run consistently so well. You, when, you have, when you finally have a hiccup going from the hundreds of thousands of transactions to millions, it, it's the first time anyone's paid attention to those systems in 40, 30, 40 years is because they run so consistently and so well and they're so efficient that people don't do that. Well, okay, so when you go to, to producing, when, when, when a um, megabyte of storage, maybe it was a gigabyte of storage, cost you $10 million, how do you organize things to even make the computer do something for you that's useful? You use a posting process, you have no other choice. And even when you use a posting process, you still have, you're not gonna go produce all of the balances that you could produce off of the transactions. You're gonna make a subset of those that are critical to running the business. You're gonna decide what is the most important things to have to get that done within the time frame required. Here's the daily financial cycle. The daily financial cycle, and I've got banking, but a typical ERP, they're very similar, to be honest with you. Maybe this one, this one doesn't tend, the ERP system doesn't tend to have as much volume uh, 
but the computer systems that are used tend to be smaller. They don't have as much capacity either. And so the, the processing time involved tends to be, the, the periods tend to be about the same in some sense, just because the machine capacities are lower. So if you look at the, the banking system, 8 a.m. is the critical time because we're opening for business. We have to know what the enterprise perspective is, what our cash on hand is, what our, what our uh, receivables are, what our payables are going to be in banking. It's what our, our loans are um, and what our, our deposits demand is going to be. That's the start of the day. And then the systems are dedicated for the most part all day to online transaction processing. Um, but things in the world, the world turns around on, on its axis. Half of the world is dark at any one time. That the, the, the fact that that's going to continue to happen for my lifetime, I'm, I'm hopeful, and all of your lifetimes, and it has for a very long time now, means that we're going to continue to have this, this cycle of daily processing where after things slow down, we then go organize those transactions from the day and we do posting to detail customer balances. In banking, it's to your deposit system, it's to the credit card system, it's to the loan system, the, the student loan system, the, the, the car loan system, the commercial loan system, the trading systems. Those things start running in the first part of the night. And because we have to maintain customer contract balances, these are subledgers. They, they're very detailed. These are the very detailed balances. And our machine gets divided up that each one of these subledgers, and even sometimes by geographies, and you know, more finely broken down, all of these things run in parallel. All of our subledgers run in parallel to each other because they, they can be independent because the transactions for a particular subledger are known, the purpose of that subledger is understood, the master file for that subledger is clearly defined. After that finishes, you're gonna have a small period here where those systems usually talk to each other. They send each other back and forth transactions that have been generated clearing processes and there's there's a second perhaps a second posting process that takes those additional transactions and reapplies them the next okay so now we're at 5 a.m okay we've got three hours until 8 a.m when we open for business and we have to keep ourselves some time an hour perhaps as a safety factor in case something goes wrong so that we don't disrupt our business by our it systems not running this is when the general ledger runs. Okay, so we've used from 11 p.m. until 5 8 a.m. perhaps, the bulk of the night, to go to the detailed customer posting. There is no possible way, but this all is a customer perspective. This is what the customer sees on their balances. This isn't an enterprise perspective, which requires adherence to GAAP and to our management accounting processes. And, and it combines it eliminates intercompany transactions and all sorts of stuff well there is no way within you know the two hours we have available here that you're going to go reprocess the entire company again you just don't have that machine capacity to do everything at the detailed level so what you do when a gigabyte of story costs 10 million dollars is you aggregate aggregation to balances has the highest elasticity of control. It can make the same kind of system work for you as an individual that works for the largest organizations in the world. The principle they use is aggregation. They aggregate transactions to get to the perspective they need. And they can do that within the computing capacity they have available. You, you can do you will take the computing capacity you need for the online system and for the detailed posting, and that's fixed. That's what your computing capacity is going to be for this, this two hour window. And so you're gonna choose attributes off of the detailed transactions that are gonna get you to a set of balances that will fit, can be processed within that time period. 
Okay. So one more slide and then we're gonna take a little breather here and we're gonna kind of go over this in a different way, right? The, what we, what we did, kind of going back to this slide, these critical balances here, the ones that were the most important that we select, we said those have to be done by 8 a.m. So in the nighttime, we do our detailed customer posting, and then we say, okay, in the couple hours remaining, we're going to make the enterprise perspective right here. And then, the, whatever computing capacity happens to be around or that we have available in other systems or we're able to purchase to make reporting processes as our computing environments have grown, our computing costs have grown, we're gonna go make other balances that are of interest through the, the next day. But all of the balances that are run every bank, all of the analytical outputs that, that are used to run every company not all of them get produced every day because the computing capacity isn't there. Some of them, they're still very large organizations, very large banks. The, their business still runs in many respects on reconciling risk in a T1, T plus one, but the risk perspective doesn't show up until the next day. This, I mean, this right here, this is, a big deal. And then other ones are a weekend and other analytical outputs are month end. So what you have happening here is what you've got is you've got a bifurcation of the data supply chain. The transactions that are used to produce the GL balances are highly aggregated from the day's transactions and targeted to that set of balances by itself. And but but those balances can't produce all these other perspectives that are needed because all the attributes have been dropped off. And so what we do is we go back to the originating transactions again, or perhaps take just the balances from the source systems in some cases, and we re-aggregate them to the other positions. I call this a bifurcated data supply chain. A data supply chain takes transactions and turns them into an analytical output. And we have one data supply chain that's our critical data supply chain in the general ledger. And then we've got all these other data supply chains that start from the same raw materials and they go produce their other outputs. And because they're bifurcated, you end up, you embed in the system reconciliation issues because the rules, the posting logic for creating the general ledger does not get used in, in most of these other balances for creation processes. And so now we end up by structurally design because of, because of limited compute capacity and the daily financial cycle, we end up with, with reconciliation all over the place. People want the general ledger balance, but the data and the rules they use to get to those balances is completely different. And this is in endemic in our business systems. Okay, I'm going to go through um, the same thing kind of this, uh, another time, but with very simplified graphics, and maybe we'll go a little bit faster now. Um, because we'll get to something here called the minimum cost curve. This uh, took me five years to develop. I published this two years ago on my blog. It hasn't been academically reviewed, but um, it, I think it's an important idea. If we think about, again, going back to what we're talking about transactions versus balances, right? Transactions, the data growth over time, that, that growth in computing, data growth over time looks like this sort of a curve. When we add balances to the transactions, so the orange line is total data here, whereas the blue is just the transactions. Balances don't add a lot of, of volume. If we think about accessed data though, just because we have a transaction and because we've made balances, the data we access to produce analytical reports doesn't grow as quickly because the, um, 
because the the balances reduce the data we have to access to get to any analytical per, um, output. So if we take then and say, okay, our computing cost over time, if we're using transactions, our computing cost from 1964 wouldn't decline at as high a rate as if we use balances. If we use balances, our computing cost over time, because we're accessing less data, becomes more efficient. Okay, the impact of reconciliation, though, this is the negative impact on balances, using balances. Balances require reconciliation, and so there's a cost inherent, an additional cost inherent in using balances. Okay, okay if we combine those previous curves, and this is a, uh, an isoquant chart. I think Rick was the one that gave me the right name for it. If you think of each uh, tick along the x axis here is producing this, the total set of needed reports and analytical outputs, but doing it with different configurations of balances versus transactions. If we used if, if to produce our reports we started here and we produced all the reports using only transactions then the y-axis here is cost is, an, is, is a set of cost or time it's that sort of y-axis both of those get accumulated here because you trade cost for time you can use a smaller compute environment to produce something over a longer period of time if you want to wait. So we can start and do everything with the transactions alone. If we add a few balances, it decreases the number of transactions we require to produce the same set of analytical outputs. And, and even more here, you know, we're using more balances which require fewer transactions to produce those outputs. At some point, we end up on this set of the graph where we're actually, our systems can actually be producing balances. I've seen over the course of my career, numerous projects where people are saying, we produced all of these reports. We have these systems to produce all these reports. Does anyone use these reports? We, we you know the system has been running for years. Well, if no one is, is using any of those reports, you're over here. You're producing, you're producing balances and you can the the number of permutations of the transactions can exceed the number of transactions involved um, because there's more permutations than can be made than there were originating transactions from 25 transactions five different attributes the number of values in each one of those attributes i can make 600 balances off of 25 transactions so it's possible to be over here in this space and to be honest with you most of our systems because we started with the simple ledger design principle, which was effective computing environment. Most of our business systems have ended up in this side of it. We are not in this space. This is the minimum uh, cost point. If we used mostly balances to produce our reports, but used transactions for some reports that are unique or that aren't well suited to produce in production from balances or are ad hoc needed only periodically. This is the minimum cost point for maintaining financial data. Like I said, I think most of our businesses are on that far side. So if we think about the traditional historical business system back to 1964, you could only maintain two balances. One set of balances would be the customer vendor balances. And then the other balance was the enterprise balance. It was the general ledger. And those were the only two balances that you could produce and maintain in the systems because the cost of the systems. If you think about the reconciliation that happened between those, the cost of reconciliation, which isn't a computing cost, it becomes a human cost because you cannot fully automate reconciliation. You can automate the test for reconciliation, but if there's a breakage, the systems do not discover the breakage very well. Uh, that's hard to automate fully. So the full cost of this environment was up here a little bit because we're using balances. And the more balances we use, the greater the reconciliation cost. 
Well, today's environment, we're not in 1964. That growth in computing means we have a lot more data, a lot more attributes. So we're, we now have started to grow customer balances, data warehouses balances, data mart balances, reporting environment balances, analytical systems, Excel spreadsheets itself just makes duplication of data extreme. We're in a very different point than where we could potentially be if we organized our data differently. In the last, this is kind of the last um, segment here, and then I'll start to pause and give you a chance to ask questions. In the last um, year, I started the process a year ago. It's kind of kicked into higher gear the last month and a half with Rakesh's efforts and others joining. Um, starting to develop a new open source project called shareledger.org. And we'll talk a little bit about where this goes, um, the business case, and then the vision statement for that. Some give you a little bit of sense of what the system might ultimately look like, the kinds of systems I'm envisioning that might be part of this. And then we'll get more directly to the REA work that's come about in the last couple of months uh, from from reviewing some of uh, Bill and his his collaborators' most recent uh, forthcoming monograph. Um, to this point, we've talked about, I've, I've talked about everything has, has not really radically changed the, there isn't any sharing of this data externally to the organization. We've talked about a universal ledger that brings together the sub-ledgers and increases the enterprise perspective in that detailed repository, that, that enterprise universal ledger is what I, I term that. But that can be done by an organization and has been done by the SAP or customers. And they maintain that, but they don't actually share that data. Blockchain, Bitcoin changed the idea. Uh, it was a far reaching idea. I'm gonna describe a little bit where I think it goes wrong a little bit. You know, just think about ledgers from your personal perspective. If you're you know, 40 years ago, everybody maintained a personal ledger. It's called your checkbook. Um, you, you, the bank had their ledger and once a month they would send you this piece of paper or if you went into the branch you could get it you know some of these details more quickly but if you didn't have your personal ledger you ran blind most of the month as to what your financial position was and the the total the balance is what the ledger is. You take the transactions, which is the amount here of each check, you add it to the line before balance to get a running balance. So 40 years ago, everybody did that. 20 years ago, some people stopped doing that and started to, they automated their personal ledger, you know, with, with Quicken and other similar type tools. Microsoft Money was another one. And then it developed with the advent of the internet developed that you could automatically download these transactions as opposed to hand entering them into, but you still had two different ledgers. In this instance, we still have two different ledgers and we're reconciling between them and there would be drift between them. No matter how careful you were, no matter how much automatic download you tried to do, you always ended up with something that caused your ledger to look different than the bank ledger. And it took a lot of time to do that. Two years ago, I made a change in my financial, personal financial system. I've used Quicken since 1992, maybe 1994. And I said, you know, let's go use a new tool. There's a number of them out there. Personal capital is one, Mint is another. That basically is a mashup of my ledgers. I put in my, and, and all of the, the young, People on the phone will probably know this, and I don't, you know, I, as I talk to people that are over 40, they, they're not aware of it. What it does is it basically, it, it pulls together your ledgers from where, whoever you have a financial position with into a single perspective. And there's one field that is, that it gives you to control. <laughs> it's called the category. Basically, that's your chart of account. And that's the only new element really in this mashup 
is you get to it the systems guess for you what the category might be based upon the business name and it gets them you know 80 90 percent correct but you know it doesn't sometimes prime shows up as a bar and and when it's you know amazon prime something right doesn't quite get it right all the time um but that's the one field in here that's unique to you as an individual and that allows you to produce your consolidated perspective and to be honest with you, you're really not maintaining multiple ledgers. You've gone to, you're relying upon the company ledgers, you're sharing the ledger, okay? But the thing that I, the, the, that I think of we've gone wrong is it's not really about blockchain. I do a whole series of videos about blockchain gaps. Sharing a ledger is a powerful concept, but blockchain by its nature of trying to get to a trustless environment decreases the efficiency. I guess I better say a bit more about that since I've introduced it here. If Bill and I were decided to be partners in a business and being partners in a business means we're going to share a ledger, share some set of ledger, financial data. I do that today with my wife. My wife and I share a ledger for our personal finances, right? Well, my wife and I and I have a high level of trust. So between the two of us, our security measures for recording in our ledger are we can write stuff down in pencil because I'm not really worried about her going and erasing it and changing it. And she's not worried about me doing it. Now with Bill, I don't know Bill quite as well. And it's a business relationship. So we're going to be a little bit more diligent about this. But we have a high level of trust. So we're going to write it down in pen. But we're just going to use paper and, and pen. And yeah, there's a risk there. Right, Bill. Overnight, if I when I go to sleep, he could pull out the ledger and he could manipulate the page and rewrite it to, to be something different. He could go change the ledger, and I have some risk in that. But because we have trust, we don't have to we don't have to spend a lot of money in security to manage that. Okay, when you try to go to a trustless system, when you try to take trust out of financial systems. Listen, our whole banking system in the entire world is built upon trust. It's all about trust. So trying to take that out, the cost for doing that means that instead of Bill and I writing down our ledgers on, um, with pen on paper, because we don't want to have to trust each other at all, where you end up from an efficiency standpoint is that we're going to end up writing our ledgers in granite we're going, to in, we're going to engrave on granite blocks each transaction because then it's so hard to do that and it takes so long to do and it's so expensive to do that that when I go to bed at night, I have confidence that Bill isn't going to be able to go, you know, wipe out, sandblast a sheet of granite clean or get a new sheet of granite and recarve all of the transactions. Blockchain as a technology, the security model for trustlessness is so expensive that it's never going to scale to replace our existing financial systems because our existing financial systems cost us a, a thousandth of a penny to do a transaction and to do that on blockchain might be cost us a penny. Well, the cost of trustlessness is a thousand times. And I don't know if you feel like you know, increasing your banking fees a thousand percent in order to be in a trustless environment. I don't, and I don't know anyone else that will. So, so blockchain is working in this periphery of little tiny problems that we could never automate in the past because we have to share data. But the line, the scope of those systems is so on the outside of, of all of our existing financial systems that it's almost the width of the line is, is minuscule as it expands the total financial systems. Where share ledger is going, where I want it to go, is to focus on how do we, how do we share ledgers in, a, in such a way that get us to the core of those systems. So why, but, but I think this shared ledger is an important concept because you know, Eric and, and Bill and many others, me included, Rick included, we know that there's inherent inefficiencies in our existing financial systems and have been for decades. But the way to change that has been difficult because the cost of those systems and the efficiency of them 
you'd have to cut the cost on the existing systems to in order to justify replacing them. And that's difficult to do. But I think sharing a ledger opens up a self-funding path for doing the transformation that we're talking about doing. Because what happens here, if we think about a traditional ERP business, you know, the process of ordering goods and receiving goods and recording those goods and paying for those goods in today's world might be <clears throat> 10 different transactions by these four different parties. If we were able to share the transaction and not just the transaction, but also the resulting balance between those parties, we might reduce all of that work down <clears throat> to three business events. But again, it's not just about sharing transactions, which blockchain is focused on. A ledger includes balances. A ledger gives you a position as of a point in time. And over, over time in business, you reconcile positions because you don't pay for every transaction, you pay for an outstanding balance. And so the shared ledgers have to include our ability to share balances as well. So doing this might re result in a 60% reduction in transaction costs. I see that in my own personal financial system. The time I spend doing data entry and reconciliation for my own ledger has probably reduced 60, 70, maybe 80% for, for my personal financial management because I rely upon those shared ledgers with my other financial institutions. I have to only maintain a limited set of fields, just my category. So if we're able to actually get to this sort of reduction, you now start to fund the transformation of these financial systems that in many cases are 30, 40 years old. I'm not gonna read through this. You'll kind of understand that. So the idea of shareledger.org is to build and work on that. This is a vision statement, a preliminary vision statement Rakesh and I, I he asked me to, to develop and, and I've submitted to him for proposal. Really, shareledger.org is about data focus, interoperability, and accessibility of data. I'm gonna give you a briefly, we're gonna go through these slides pretty quickly. A year ago, I woke up and I said, well, what would, if I had a website that allowed me to share a ledger with somebody, the trusted party like Bill, if I wanna buy things from Bill and, and I have some level of trust with him and I don't feel like I need to use Granite to record things, what would the website look like? So I mocked up these screens. Many of these screens I find Rakesh is actually built. I discovered months later that, that his FPE system includes these things. But you start with certainly defining a new login. You join the website. In the website, you have to define your fields that are interesting, the, your chart of account, the data that's going to be help you manage your business, what things you're going to record on transactions. And you have to define what the possible values for those fields are. This is expensive, it's time consuming, it takes time. I don't think that companies are gonna start from scratch to do this. They're going to leverage their existing systems to give them fields and values but most of the fields and values already are shared in some way because we produce statements for, for vendors, produce statements for customers, and we sell things, and we produce purchase orders. And so in that process, we do have personal fields and permissible values. You then have to define, you would have to define a ledger. What is the ledger that I want to, to maintain? What's this ledger about? What are the kinds of transactions and the balances that I need off of those transactions. You then say, well, who do I want to have participate in this ledger with me? And you select participants and you share a ledger with them. Then you go from the, the fields you have put in and the fields that they put in and you negotiate what are the fields that we're going to share and what are the values that we're going to share in those fields. And then you have to decide, okay, for posting processes, what balances are we going to share? When are we going to make balances? And when are we going to agree on the running total of those balances? And how do we share those? And then you have to start to define logic that allows you to update those fields, um, both your personal and your 
few fields. And then you'd move on to um, to sharing that ledger, and it becomes it becomes the primary tracking source. I guess I might say, in your personal world, just like the mashup of my financial from all of the different businesses that I maintain financial relationships, I would have a mashup of all of my shared ledgers that get me to an enterprise perspective. And I'd have a shared ledger that is not shared. I'd have one ledger that's just like my historical ledger for parties that I don't care to share a ledger with. I'm just going to maintain it like I always have. And all of my transactions that are unshared, that are unique, that are one-off, are going to be in that thing. And when I want a consolidated enterprise perspective, I'm bringing all of those together to get to the enterprise perspective. In the last two months uh, in doing this process on shareledger.org, I've gone back to the REA theories. Um, Bill shared with me uh, his forthcoming monograph, which uh, I find very enlightening. And I found it updated my knowledge uh, quite a bit. And I went back to a bunch of historical um, data that Eric gave me um, back to the original paper and have reviewed those recently. I've also pulled together some POCs that I've been doing over the last few years to inform this process. If I look at the, the, the first thing we have to get to is we're not gonna define a universal ledger that has all the fields that somebody's interested in. A bank um, is going to have a bank system, a regulatory and reporting systems tend to have something on the order of 200, 300 attributes of interest in total. Um, in the general ledger, the primary posting, you'll have something on the order of seven to 10 fields that are of interest. If you maintain access to the customer contract, then you open up those other hundreds of fields that are of interest. And me as a person, I have a single field. My category really is the one that I'm interested in. Category, time is already baked into every system. You know, the company that I'm doing business with is, is, is embedded in the, the transaction capture. The one field I have to add is, is category. So for a person, it might be one field. For a business, it's going to be multiple fields. Share a ledger needs to have the first thing I think we need to develop out of share a ledger will be some sort of a data model that suggest what the entities are for our um, for a share ledger sort of structure that then can be tailored off of for individual circumstances. If I look at our history on building large systems, this is a very simple, simplified version of the high volume data entities for one of our customers. And it had involved party arrangement, which is like a contract, the journal summary file. Um, which is position and the standard journal entries. If you looked at the, when I first looked at this, thought about this, contrasted it back with the RA, said, yeah, we kind of have three entities there. We have, you know, involved party, we have arrangement, we have standard journal entries. The position I recognize is an efficiency. It's not really something you, you want to maintain, but it's something you need for the, for the system to be efficient. That was my first cut. And uh, I used this model, this diagram to explain to others who I'm working with what REA means. Um, I take them through some examples of, of how you use REA to get to an independent definition of what things mean. But as I had thought about it more, I said, you know, this isn't really right because in banking, we don't really track economic resources in the same way you do with an inventory system, perhaps. Money is the resource, but we don't do specific tracking of money. It's pooled resource. It's undefined pool. Arrangement in our system is really the contract. And so what I noted is that the REA model didn't, uh, it didn't uh, we broke the REA mold as we built these systems a little bit in that we use something called contract. And we didn't really use economic resource because banking Customers provide deposits, which are the inventory, and customers take loans, which is the sales of the inventory in a certain sense, and you don't track the specific money. But if I were to update the simple model we had um, and, and make it include resources, 
and I start using SAP or concept called common key buffering, which is important for uh, efficiency at scale, I start to end up with this sort of a data model where I've got involved party, I might add something called commitment based upon Pavel's work a few years ago where he put commitment into his data model, um, resource and resource position. But the sort order for these common key buffer groups tend to be different. This can be a hierarchy on this side of things, but commitments and resources have different their different perspectives and, and the sort order of the keys tends to be different. And so you may end up with a second resource group. You end up resorting the file if you want to do it very efficiently using techniques from 50 years ago that still will make your computers very efficient today. You would take the transactions and resort them um, by resource in order to update the resource position independent from the arrangement commitment position. Um, this just drills down more on, on those ideas of, of how that, that would work and what resource or contract positions might be involved. I was interested to note in the monograph um, the, the recognition by Bill and, and collaborators of what the impact of a shared technology would be. And these are some quotes that I pulled out where they, they are moving towards that sort of idea as well. And this sort of model is something that I had recognized for a couple of years now, that there will be shared aspects, but there'll also be private aspects. Even if Bill and I were sharing a business, I still have my private data for my other financial positions that I'm not going to share with him. There's no reason that he was interested in that. And so that becomes private data. And he similarly has his own private financial positions. And that's going to be true even on some transactions that we engage in, right? In banking, a, a key aspect is loan loss reserves, which says how much am I likely not to collect on these loans? Well, when I make a loan to somebody, I probably won't want to share with them what my loan loss reserve is that says to them how much I'm not going to collect from them. So there's going to be those private positions. The next few slides just kind of go through um, and start to, these are working slides for our working group about how we would share a ledger. That if we're in a shared nothing environment, this, or shared everything environment, where like me and my spouse are, you know, that's how we would do things. But if today we're running in a shared nothing environment, these concepts are very common in computer system architecture. Share everything tends to be the mainframe, share nothing tends to be distributed client server. Well, where we want to get to is we want to get to selected sharing where some of the data, some of the structure and some of the rules are shared between, but there's also private aspects to the system. Um, I'm not gonna go through that one. Just, it gives a sense of how I would combine each, each entity has their own version of these large data entities. And, and this isn't the full data model, but it's intended to focus on those that have the high volumes, which is really the issue in compute processing for analytical purposes. This starts to show how the reference data would get built for the shared transaction. For example, B here, Tom sees that as accounts receivable, whereas J sees that as accounts payable. So you have to model in the shared environment an independent perspective, and they have to be able to interpret that independent perspective for what, uh, for their view of it. This gives another working example. Okay, and I think I'll come back to this last slide, um, maybe in conclusion as we start to wrap up, but I'm gonna pause there to open it up for questions. You wanna give us your last slide? Yes. Well, yeah, I could, I could do that. That briefly, I just, um, yesterday I released my last conversation with, with uh, Eric that I recorded a year and a half ago um, on my blog. And as I wrote the blog entry, um, we had talked a little bit about a week before about predicting, um, predicting things and predicting things are, are risky to do. I noted last night after I released the blog entry that uh, predictions made by obscure people tend to be forgotten if they're wrong very quickly. But 
you know, I just, as I thought yesterday, I've taken a moment to think about where uh, I've come from and what I've seen in financial systems and, and where I sense we're going. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote down these predictions briefly, maybe. Um, any currency is a fundamentally transferable credit. Um, and, and so another one of my passions is around thinking about trustworthiness and integrity. And, you know, this issue, issue of efficiency, I really strongly believe that um, those that invest in efficiency of trust are going to continue to have greater efficiencies available to them. And it goes clear down to the currencies that we use. I'm not going to be surprised if in 10, 15 years, um, if, you, if we went back to the 1840s, people had all sorts of different currencies because every bank issued their own currency. And with where we're going with virtual currencies and, and the disparity of trustworthiness in the issuing of those currencies, because it basically is a transferable credit, in a few years time, I won't be surprised if we don't manage multiple currencies in our personal financial systems, mm. because that, that will be circulating in the world. If that happens, um, the access to information to assess the trustworthiness of those individuals and the issues of those currencies is going to become even more critical. And those that are committed to transparency will have higher trustworthiness and have greater <coughs> value to their currencies over time. Ultimately, the, the data platforms we have today in social media and the search engine access, it, it's organized around URLs. Um, you know, Amazon has organized uh, data around SKUs. Well, our financial data isn't as similarly organized and the financial platform that may be evolving would be something that's an open system that it's organized around transactions and balances. I've said for years, if somebody develops a Facebook-like equivalent for financial data, it's Facebook is organized around a post. Somebody doing that around financial data, when you go to financial data, you're presented with sets of transactions and sets of balances, and you move back forwards and forwards in time between balances. You make new transactions on balances and you apply transactions to balances. So, you know, just, I think that it's a, it'll be interesting to see as, as Eric noted a year and a half ago in the video released yesterday, it's sometimes hard to predict what the um, triggering event is for large changes in the world. Um, but, you know, we certainly didn't anticipate a year and a half ago the kinds of economic events we're having happening now. People that are invested in integrity and trust, um, like I have, I've had with, with, with Rakesh and with Rick and, and, and others that I've worked with for years and with all of you, you get efficiency from that trustworthiness. So investing mm -hmm. in that and building systems built upon sharing and community I think is going to increase the efficiencies in the world and bring new poor people, the smallest merchants in the, in the world uh, into this by low cost technology, access to, to the bookkeeping processes that they don't have to learn bookkeeping in order to do and give them the information and access that they need to, to improve their lives like, like uh, mm. bookkeeping does for all of us. That's on my blog entry, actually. Let me just uh, let me just point you there, the blog, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, part seven, pressure to change. Here's the all those bullet points are right here on the blog. Okay. If you're interested okay. in that.